You're listening to Counselors on the Couch, an open conversation between counselors, coaches, and specialists discussing how people just like you can solve a multitude of challenges. Counselors on the Couch is hosted by Dr. Chuck Carrington. We invite you now to join us on the couch to listen in as Dr. Chuck and his specialist guests and experts candidly share insider information on how they help solve the problems that drive people into counseling. Okay, guys, well, welcome back. I think this is our eighth mm-hmm. episode on divorce. And with us today, we have Kathy and her husband, Jim, has returned. And of course, James and myself. And we're going to be talking about the financial impacts of divorce. Mm-hmm. The financial impacts are quite varied. Of course, they're unique to everybody's situation. They're also unique to where you live, how much you've earned in the past, all kinds of things. So we're going to talk in, mostly in generalities about some of the impacts that people have to go through during the process of arriving at a divorce, and then what happens afterwards, because your financial standing radically will change normally uh, during and post-divorce, and it also impacts the children and a lot of other considerations. So we're going to start today by talking about in the process. Mm-hmm. So I'm just wondering, James is the most recently divorced of all of us. I think, Kathy, you said it was how many years ago? Not not to date you or anything. No, it was 91 that I left. I think it was 96 that the divorce took place. So. Okay, so that's quite a while back. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of hard to remember. Finances have changed. You know, our economy keeps, you know, it's changing all the time. Mm-hmm. Employment opportunities aren't what they used to be, but more women are working than they used to be. So things just, the variables change. My divorce was 20, no, 11 years ago. And I just remember it was quite a radical change for me, going from being part of a, a partnership to being an individual. Looking for wisdom. I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Kathy first, uh, just because you've been doing this for so long in divorce care. I'd like to hear from you, maybe your perspective on in the process of moving towards a divorce, how do you see it impacting women specifically? Okay, in the process of moving towards, well, before you leave, usually you you. That is not affected before you leave. But once you leave, um, there may be situations like in my situation, I had been a stay at home mom for seven years. I had not worked in seven years. I did not have a credit card in my name. So I essentially had nothing. Um, I had to start over from scratch. Um, But usually, like you were saying, it's like, you know, you've got one household for all the expenses. Next thing you know, you got two households for all the expenses. And sometimes it can can come as a shock, especially if you're leaving a situation that wasn't good and you're you're experiencing the initial relief of not being in that situation. But it's just a matter of, you know, where, where, where do you find the money? You know, where, how do, how are you going to live? Those are thoughts that go through your mind. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, I haven't, worked in in seven years i've got a three-year-old and a seven-year-old what i ended up doing home daycare is what i ended up doing after a bunch of um, things that happened they arrived at that decision and i did that for like about two and a half years until my son was was in first grade yeah so finding work if you can because if you have children that's mm-hmm. tough you said you have a credit card in your name i know a lot of uh, clients of mine they come to me so i don't even have the house in my name everything's mm-hmm. in his name mm-hmm. And so they have no assets. And if you're the one who has to move out, you have to find resources. It costs money to move out. It costs money to live. On the other hand, generally speaking, it's the guy that ends up leaving, either mm-hmm. you know by choice or by force. Quite frequently, um, the man is asked to leave because there's children. The children stay in their home. Or there's a... Um, there could be games being played with temporary restraining orders that are not legitimate, or there could be legitimate reasons. Mm-hmm. Or the divorce might say, well, the wife and the children have a right to stay in that home. You're just going to have to go and suck it up. I hear that. So um, let's hear from the guys. What about from the male perspective? You know, What are some of the financial impacts guys worry about in divorce? Well, I think that there's a lot of things you have to look at. The best way I know to describe it is that when you're married to someone, you have a small business. Your home, you can look at it sort of like a business and it has income and it has expenses and it has capital items and it has short term and long term goals that are all wrapped up around that. And you've decided to shut the business down and dissolve the business. 
So there has to be an accounting done of what are the assets, what are the liabilities, how are you going to, in as fair a manner as possible, divide those things. But regardless of how you look at it, you've just lost half your asset base. If you had a combined income of $100,000, assuming you both made the same, your income is now cut in half. The hard part is, is that for some reason, people seem to go into this with the illusion that everything else in their life is going to change, but their living status is not going to change. But it does, because in the best scenario, you've just lost half of your income. Uh, in the worst scenario, if you had one spouse that wasn't working, um, then that one spouse has lost access to 100% of their income. So it's a pretty rude awakening. And there's the short term issues associated with how am I going to put gas in the car? How am I going to make a car payment? How am I going to make a credit card payment? How am I going to make a house payment? Where am I going to live? Do I even have enough cash to be able to go and rent an apartment? And some people use money as a real weapon, mm -hmm. as a way to control. So, you know, if you've got a spouse that's the predominant breadwinner, fine, you can leave. I've heard of stories where people have gone and cleaned out bank accounts. Um, people have gone and hid money in safety deposit boxes because it doesn't matter so much about the dollar signs the money becomes a weapon of control mm -hmm. um, the money becomes a representation of the level of pain that the other person wants them to feel it's easy to go to an accountant and they can look at everything and split it down the middle but that's not really what it's about it's it's about the emotional tie that comes along with assets and with money that where it really, really gets bad. Forget the fact that, you know, you now have l half of what you had before, if you're lucky. Uh, and that's in the present. And you can forget about any, in most cases, any future income. So it's getting through the immediate as well as trying to plan for the long term. And it's, it's a very tough situation. Before we started the podcast today, we were talking and Kathy said something about fairness. And I said, well, there's nothing fair about divorce. <laughs> we were all kind of laughing about that. But at the same time, that's a reality. And mm -hmm. when it comes to the financials, I don't care if you get 50 percent, 51 percent, 60 percent. Even if you're the person who gets more, you still don't think it's fair. That just seems to be a universal. Um, and I, I think what James just said about making it a weapon probably affects a lot of women. It affects men, too. I don't, I don't want to say it doesn't. But I've seen it used as a weapon against women, too, because mm -hmm. if there's children involved, there's a lot of leverage there. What do you think about that one, Kathy? <sighs> it's, it, I, I agree with that um, because as far as the survival, just the survival, part of the survival is being able to count on that child support money to come in. That's not extra money. That's what you need to in order for your kids to to survive. Um, in Virginia, they actually have a formula that they, that they use based on how much you earn, how much the other person earns. And there's a formula that they have. So it's not emotional as far as what they come up with, as far as what each child gets, as far as child support. Um, so it's it's fortunately in that regard, there's not negotiation. However, it does involve truth, you know, being truthful as far as what your assets are. It becomes truthful as far as what the what your income is. But also it there's a lot of resentment. I think what I have experienced is seeing a lot of resentment on the part of the person that has to pay the child support. And then last week we were talking about kids and pulling the kids into that and having your son come to you and say, by the way, mom, how come I never get to see any of that child support money? Where's my money? Um, you know, from a young child saying that to you. Um, and so you're you're trusting that somebody 
to whom you're no longer married, to you probably have, due to the system of divorce, an adversary relationship, you're trusting that person is going to provide that money to you each month in a timely manner. And so many times there's actually games played with giving the money. Um, so that actually is one of those things that was painful for me during the time. Um, I remember when my son turned 18, I was grateful in that the child support stopped then. And I didn't have to have that interaction every mm-hmm. month that went on from all the, from all those years. And we should talk about that uh, if we remember a little bit later on, because in the aftermath of divorce, there's things like that that are that prolong the pain and mm-hmm. things that help bring closure to the pain. Mm-hmm. And money has a lot to do with that. Yep. Child support is a huge problem. So going into the divorce, I don't know how Virginia works, which is where we're at, but a lot of states, you don't get a, uh, a support order until you get into court. Mm-hmm. So it's voluntary, but you still divided the house mm-hmm. in the meantime. And so a lot of people don't have a guarantee of child support. Then we have custody battles over, okay, I don't want to pay child support. I want 50% custody basically mm-hmm. to avoid paying child support. But if the person who makes less money or if he has to be at home um, can't make up the difference, mm-hmm. then they're, they're impoverished. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes child's custody becomes a monetary um, fight as well. What about you, Jim? You have any thoughts about going into divorce? The, the well, one thing that hasn't been mentioned thus far is where there was one set of income and expense. There are now two right. sets of ex- expenses, and the income level hasn't changed. So um, the cost of living has gone up, and that's not easily uh, absorbed in many cases. So, um, in my case, um, I had to provide child support, which drastically reduced my ability to meet my obligations for bills, and that's just the way it unfolded. Dividing the household sounds simple, but you're you're doubling everything, and you're reducing your your earning capacity at the Mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. And it's cheaper for two to live together than two people live apart. Mm -hmm. Now you talk about family. If you have multiple kids, you can't just move into a one bedroom apartment or efficiency apartment. You have to move into something with multiple rooms or you can't have custody. Sometimes you can't even have overnight visits. Mm-hmm. If, so you have, so you have to have two homes. Now, if, you, if you're single, it's a little bit easier. It's kind of like going back to college. You're starting over still. But there's still all the debt that you carry mm-hmm. with you. Um, car payments. Car payments are a big one I see nowadays because people's car payments are as big as a house payment. At least in the old days, house payments were... You know, six, seven hundred dollars a month car payments are averaging six to eight hundred a month each. <clears throat> so there's a lot to consider going in. What about attorneys? Attorneys can be quite uh, depleting on your assets, especially if you don't have many to begin with. Well, I think that's one of the areas that is very hard to manage because there is not only do you have you know, the emotional upheaval that you're in and the things that you're trying to accomplish and the, and you trying to protect yourself, but you have to respond to what the other party does as well. So you may be trying to do this as cheaply as you possibly can. You know, you have a stopwatch there every time you call your attorney because they charge in six minute increments, by the way. Um, so if they're charging $350 an hour, which is not an unreasonable rate, you know, every six minutes, 35 bucks. So, but when then, if your spouse is extravagant, is the best way I know to say it, in, in what they're trying to accomplish, and they have all these motions filed, and they have all these orders filed, well, you have to respond to all of that. So in those cases, that's going to cost you money, but those aren't things that you initiated, but you have no choice. So you can't really budget for the attorney fees because you just don't know what's going to come up and it gets to be very 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 expensive does anybody have a feel for what the average attorney fee for divorce per side costs at least in virginia does that ever come up in your groups no but i would say that it probably is 20 to thirty thousand dollars, and that's a total and that's if you don't go to court that's if you can find a way to settle amicably 
you know, if you go to mediation, the judge is going to cost you 400 bucks an hour. You're going to be in there for a minimum of 10 hours. If your spouse thinks you're hiding money, a forensic accountant is going to cost you 350 bucks an hour. It's going to take them a minimum of five to 10 hours to go through all your accounting and figure that out. You know, your lawyer, uh, that's going to be 350 to 500 dollars an hour. It's going to co- take you. 700 bucks just to go in there and tell them what the problems are before they even start trying to draft an agreement. And what happens also is this is just the monetary cost that we're talking about here. But once the process starts where other parties, other parties who aren't emotionally invested in your welfare come into the picture, um, there's dynamics that change because you, you it's, it's very, it becomes a very adversarial situation because it's not just a mat because you feel threatened and so you can respond to that threat and such like that and the attorneys god bless their hearts um aren't emotionally involved and so a lot of times with them it's a matter of i want to win you know it's not what is best for my client that and i true. know there are attorneys out there that really do look out for their for their clients i was fortunate enough to have one but um but so it, it, it and that in itself feeds into the, the the monetary process and you get sucked into it and it keeps the more adversarial it gets, the more expensive it gets. And so we what we try, you know, we we try, tell people if you can mediate your way ahead of the game. You know, as far as finances go, there are situations where you can't because it, just like it takes two people to reconcile, it takes two people to mediate. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not, you know, you can't just do it. Well, you know, one of the, one of the um, scenarios that I gave in one of the previous podcasts is that divorce is like stepping into a raging river mm-hmm. and you get washed downstream and you very quickly learn how little in control you really are. And you get thrown up on the shore somewhere way downstream. You're exhausted. You're soaking wet. You've lost everything except your life. And that's what this process is like. And if you think you're going to get in there and control it, you're just fooling yourself because it is beyond your control. Kathy, when you said other people enter in, are you talking about beyond the attorneys? Do you have somebody else in mind or just the attorney's entry into your conflict? It can be as far as entering into the conflict. It can be if the other person already has a significant other. Mm-hmm. It can it can be that. Um, but largely, I, I was I was more addressing like, as far as people entering in. It is it's it's the legal process. Everybody's involved in the legal process. But I can tell you how other people enter in. They enter in by saying, you know, um, my brother in law's sister's husband, you know, hid money. You better check and make sure that they're not hiding money, too. Yeah. Well, now you've just incurred a bunch of expense to go hire a professional to make sure that everything balances and that there is no indication from three years worth of records, which, by the way, you have to all get together Mm -hmm. and give them to somebody to prove that you're being honest. So, yes. And and it's just it's just so sad because the fact that you've got these two wounded people, even though somebody may be the one that that that. Uh, the one that requested a divorce, there's still wounds there. You've got these wounded people and you're taking these wounded people who and, and dumping all this other stuff on top that changes the process. You know, it's not just a matter of we've got these issues between us. There's more stuff thrown in there. And so it grows into a much bigger thing than it was when it first started. And for a lot of the people who are involved, Mm -hmm. it is pure sport. Yeah. So it's like having two blind people in an arena beating the life out of each other and people who it costs nothing are in the stands screaming and yelling and saying, hit them here, hit them there. And yet you're getting bloodier by the minute, Mm -hmm. but you think you're fighting for survival. Yeah. If there's child custody involved and there is an argument over who has the best home, then the court appoints people to come in and research. So there's another aspect of somebody outside making the decision for you. The guardian ad litem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's, that was one yeah. of the things I was thinking about, Kathy, when you mentioned that there's, there's children involved, sometimes uh, social services, mm-hmm. or sometimes uh, cops get involved because allegations are made. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of course, there's always the lawyers that make everything so much more fun. 
Uh, there's an awful lot of, I hate to call it, but it's game playing goes on. Mm -hmm. And then there's the um, ignorant advisors that we all have in our lives, which James just kind of mentioned. All these people complicate it. And when you're in the midst of a storm, you don't really see what's going on. And you're trusting people to give you advice because you're desperate for it. And it's that negative, uh, fear-inducing advice that tends to get everybody's attention. But then you get the people, I think, James, you said it's a sport. Mm -hmm. You get the people who can afford to play the game. And they can just ruin you. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of clients, male and female, it doesn't really matter. It depends on, like everything else in our society, who has more money. They usually get to win. Um, I have a lot of people who just give up, walk away from everything they own because the fight's too big or they lose custody of their children because they have no way to fight, monetarily fight. Mm -hmm. And it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that in, in mm -hmm. people coming through divorce care. We have seen people in that position where they they don't have the, the funds to fight for, for custody and the other person is much more powerful. And so therefore they get custody. and that the the spouse that's that's coming to us is left with nothing not only financially but also they've had their children taken away and they have child support on top of it now yeah yeah so when i divorced my wife and i had what was called a an amicable divorce mm -hmm. which is a misnomer i think but <clears throat> we agreed to get a divorce we didn't bloody each other right and we agreed in advance to sell everything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. except for things we brought into the marriage and we split it um, we got 10 cents on the dollar for everything because we auctioned off our farm and everything. And we got 10 cents on the dollar, but we split it all based on ownership. Still, we didn't come out well because everything we had spent 20 years building was sold for 10 cents on the dollar. It was not a good outcome, but it was good for us. But still, I mean, we could have spent that 90% on a lawyer, too, and, and had the, mm -hmm. James did, had somebody come in and, you know, what'd you call it? You said you had a forensic accountant come in. Is that mm -hmm. what you were talking about? Yeah. That sounds expensive right there. Just, you put the word forensic in there. <laughs> yeah, it is. What, what you just described is uh, two situations at play. One is the emotional element of what used to be and the financial element of what used to be. And in my case, if I had to do over again, I'd take all the marital debt and all the marital uh, resources and apply them against each other and then split whatever's left over, whichever way it goes. And uh, the emotional issue to hold on to my home was prevented me from doing that. Mm -hmm. But um, that's emotions present that kind of cloud the judgment on what's the best way to move ahead in this particular situation as far as what you can afford. And, and I had a room where I piled up the bills. Um, because I didn't have the money to pay him. They weren't piled. They were tossed. <laughs> I have one of those piles. In the house. <laughs> so I think you're right, Jim. The the emotional content and the business get come into conflict, and the emotional parts is what we're really after. We're, we're trying to protect our hearts. Um, sometimes we make very bad business decisions mm -hmm. based on our emotional need. Mm -hmm. Hanging onto the home. Sounds like it's important, but in the long run, how much damage are you doing to your heart? Exactly right. You know, hanging on to the, the family heirlooms, hanging on to anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, you regret that you're losing things, mm -hmm. but the emotional toll is huge. And some people feel so defeated and so battered in a divorce that even if they win, they still lose. Well, in a way, it's kind of a situation that's being foisted on you and certain parts of what were present have been taken away. And with what's left, you hold on to it more uh, tenaciously. And that, again, adds to the emotional. Good point. Well, and what we have, what I've seen in divorce care is that, you know, the, the differences between the overall character of the two parties involved really gets amplified. So let me give you a great example. You know, you've got a husband or a wife who is a saver and they're very frugal and they try to stretch everything as far as they possibly can. But then you have the other spouse who's a spender and they went out and bought the new car and they went out and bought the new boat and they piled up, you know, enormous amounts of debt. Well, all that frugality that, 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 you know, other person had goes out the window because now they got half the debt. Mm-hmm. 
And that brings in a whole nother level of emotional impact and unfairness and victimization that um, just adds to the complication of all of this. If there's one thing I could, if I could say to, you know, people who are listening to this podcast is this sounds scary, but you know what it is, (laughs) but (laughs) you're not, you're not, it's not your imagination. So it's, don't bury your head. You know, it's almost like you have to prepare yourself for what's to come. If you're entering into a divorce situation, prepare yourself. <clears throat> Don't have a rosy picture about how things are going to be. And and just be be a, awareness and learn as much as you possibly can um, to help yourself go through this process. Well, and the first place to learn, as I said earlier, since this is a small business, which you are both co-owners of, mm-hmm. You can't afford to just say, oh, he takes care of all the finances or she takes care of all the finances. You are equally responsible. You've got to get in there and you've got to know where every dime is coming from and where every dime is going. Money is like water. And if you don't tell it where to go, it just gets absorbed into the ground. And I can't tell you, you know, and Kathy, you and Jim, you guys have seen this, too. How many people come into divorce care and the spouse who's coming doesn't have a clue? about how much their husband yeah. or wife makes, doesn't have a clue about what their assets are, doesn't have a clue about how much debt they have, yeah. doesn't have any clue about any retirement savings or pensions or health insurance or anything else. Because when that divorce decree is done, you're on your own. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, health insurance, life insurance, pensions, IRAs, 401ks, you get what you get. And from that point on, you got to manage it because you're on your own, yeah. except what you can make on your own. Mm-hmm. And if you've not spent any time being an active member of the business of your family and have not spent any time trying to understand you know, the financial analyses that goes on with running a small business and a household, you got a lot of learning to do really, really fast. Mm-hmm. You said uh, medical insurance. That's a huge one, too. Oh, and I said that I had left in 1991. The divorce went through in 1996. I never pursued a divorce when I left because I wouldn't have had health insurance. Health insurance is what kept me, you know, I mean, I, I was fine without filing for divorce, but I did not have health insurance until um, I was say I think it was 1995 when I took a job that offered health insurance, and I just had such a because there was no way I could not afford it. The kids were be covered under his, but I'd have nothing. So I did not pursue the divorce. He, he ended up filing for a divorce in 1996. Right. Health insurance is one of those things where if you've not had to pay it out of your pocket before, mm. it can be quite astonishing. So I have a lot of. Uh, spouses that come in here, they're young, their husband or wife is in the military, mm-hmm. they've been enjoying the benefits of military, but they haven't been married very long, and they have small kids, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, they have no insurance for themselves. Mm-hmm. And they have for the kids, usually, I mean, mm-hmm. depending on legitimacy and such as that, but even that, you have to trust that the other person's going to pay it unless it's coming from the military or coming mm-hmm. from a garnishment. You don't always know. Mm-hmm. What if your ex-spouse loses their job? Mm-hmm. Is your health insurance gone? Mm-hmm. How you to cover yourself? I mean, six hundred dollars a month, more or less, per person um, for health sh- health insurance when you are not part of a group anymore, mm-hmm. or, or more sometimes. Mm-hmm. It's a huge expense. You know, and as we're saying this, another thought that pops into my head right now. You know, as far as people listening, there are situations that that leaving a spouse is necessary for you to live. If you are in an abusive situation, so many times, this is exactly why people don't leave an abusive situation because I could not possibly survive this on my own. I wouldn't have health insurance. Therefore, I'll put up with the abuse so I have that financial security. So that gets into a whole other situation. And if there's an abusing partner, they're aware of that. Yes. There are programs to help with that, to plan and exit Mm -hmm. things like that, um, especially for spousal battery and things like Mm -hmm. that. But But we've seen people in divorce care who have come in and they've left 
and they were planning to leave for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it took them that long to get yep. their plan together mm -hmm. and to get themselves to a point where they felt like they could leave. Because, you know, nobody wakes up one morning and says, I'm leaving you today. It just doesn't happen. They've been, and what we consistently see is that the party who leaves has been planning it for at least two or three years. Three to five years before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It takes a, an incredible assault on the relationship for someone just to walk out spontaneously. Mm -hmm. That would be a, a rarity. Mm -hmm. Well, but it appears spontaneous when it happens. But the fact is, is they've been planning it for a long time. Statistically, I think that's true. I mean, there are things, because I, I work with people who have been blindsided by spouses have done some heinous things and they have to leave or mm -hmm. the other spouse is forced out for legal reasons and suddenly there's a divorce on your plate you don't even expect it but even if you're the one looking to file the divorce it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be economical for you people divorce too quickly without thinking about this so i guess the advice on the on the pre-divorce side of this is if divorce is necessary you need to do an awful lot of research mm -hmm. a lot of planning you have to expect this is going to hurt and if you're just doing this because you're just tired of that person and you just want to do something new, have a shiny new object, think again. Mm -hmm. Because the cost of a divorce, emotionally, financially, socially, it's huge. Mm -hmm. Even if it's only been a couple of years. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, people, especially if you're young, don't think about what they've invested in another human being and what they're going to lose. That's that conjoined twins mm -hmm. being ripped apart. So you want to think about it. Sometimes you have to. You know, sometimes women are at risk. Sometimes mm -hmm. children are at risk. Mm -hmm. Sometimes husbands are at risk. They just mm -hmm. won't talk about it too much. Um, sometimes affairs happen, mm -hmm. things like that. But this should not be the go-to. No. And I think, like I said, the whole, the whole idea mm -hmm. with, with this podcast is that people are aware of these different pieces that play into it. Um, and I think this is important to become to to educate you know like i said to hear this as painful as it is is that and this is just the tip of the iceberg because we're talking about just you know the beginning the beginning and there's so much more that comes after and during so let's talk about the after part a little bit <clears throat> what are some of the things that women might expect that they will have to deal with after the divorce decree has been settled and they're now on their own whether they're have children or not. What are some of the things women have to face? Well, as you were, as we've been saying, is is financial is a big thing, and 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 not even before it lives. It's once you leave, I would say that because the, the divorce can take years as far as that goes. But just the aspect of all of a sudden you've got to provide for yourself, and not only provide for yourself, but you have to provide for your children mm -hmm. also. Um, and if you have not been in the workforce for a significant number of years, it's not just the fact that you maybe been outpaced as far as your knowledge and stuff like that goes. I remember going to apply, I was going to go apply for this job and my hands just started shaking. It, because I mean, I started shaking at just the thought of going out there and applying for a job because so much was depending upon that. And um, it's a hard step to take. It's scary going back into the workforce if you've been out of it for any length of time. So that, once again, is something that, yes, you can. So preparing yourself for that also is important. Um but and then then financially, as we touched on the um, the idea of of health insurance, sometimes you can't sometimes I mean, I was very lucky that my kid's father did not file for divorce right away and leave me without health insurance. I was fortunate with that. Um, but and you talked about, you know, the, the credit cards and such like that um, to, to, to have to zero credit. You know, zero credit. You know, boy, oh boy. I remember I was able to get a share secured credit card through Navy Federal. That was my first credit card. When I got my Discover card, <laughs> I was so excited, you know, because of the fact that I got my credit. But that goes into a whole other thing as far as credit cards and how you use them. Um, but, um, oh, you know, how are you going to pay rent? 
How are you going to pay rent? How are you going to pay rent? I, you know, um, um, what, where are you going to be able to find rent that is affordable? Can you move someplace affordable and get too far away from your husband and be snapped right back? Right. And so a lot of people, I, once again, I was fortunate in that case. I, that wasn't an option. That was not an, an, a, a, a situation that came up with me. But um, but well, yes. You get the house. Now you have taxes. Oh, yes. Upkeep. And this is not just the women. I I mean, I know a situation where there's, there's a family member decided to keep the house because of the fact that he didn't want his kids to um, have to change schools. Mm -hmm. He had no means to keep that house Mm -hmm. and, and ended up in deep in debt and in bankruptcy, you know? Um, And so that happens a lot of times too, that, you know, you, you sit, you want to provide that safe, that safe haven for your kids. But so how do you afford rent? You know, I was, I have to say again, I was fortunate. I was able to rent a, a townhome from my brother for a reasonable price. And I was able to just make ends meet. Your job prospects are also limited if you're the custodial parent. Mm-hmm. Because you could be offered a really good job, mm-hmm. but it could be in another state or another part of the state. Mm-hmm. And you can't afford to go to court and modify the agreement. And so you're landlocked. Oh, and even just paying child for daycare. Daycare. Daycare is very expensive, you know. Um, so so that's another thing is to explore your options. What options do you have? Um, some people don't feel like they have any options. And that's when it gets into one of the things they talk about is is whether or not you are, you know, as far as providing, you know, providing for your children, providing for the for the um, for their things. And sometimes because you're so intent on providing for their home and this and that, your parenting gets pushed to the side. You, you it's almost like you have to choose between am I going to be there as a parent or am I going to be there as a provider? So there's none of it's pretty. All of it's rough. Selfishness also enters the picture. It's not unusual in the divorce care world to come into a situation where um, child support or financial support has been ordered by the court, but the person that's supposed to be paying it withholds it. And it goes on for extended periods of time. In the meantime, that relied upon set of money to meet expenses uh, just builds and uh, there's no recourse immediately available. The courts don't act on that very quickly either is uh, what the track record seems to be. And that just adds to the emotional damage that comes from this because, Mm -hmm. I mean, real life scenarios of you know, we can't afford this because your dad didn't pay the child support this month, which just creates animosity between, you know, the mother and the former father and between the children and the father. And it's just a continuation of anger and hatred and bitterness. And and it's just the gift that keeps on giving. And some of it is just downright immature selfishness on the part of a father who has an obligation to support his children and refuses to do so. It can be. What other things affect the fathers, do you think, financially that uh, maybe they're not expecting besides uh, child support? Well, I think not necessarily fathers, but one of the things that, that goes on, again, when, when you're running the business of a family, is that people play different roles. And they, nav- and they gravitate towards roles which they're good at, right? So... You know, one spouse takes care of the cars because they know a lot about cars. Another spouse may take care of interior issues because they know about interior issues. Another spouse may take care of the insurance or they may take care of, of you know, the repairs or whatever. And even if they don't do them themselves, they know enough to make sure they're not getting taken advantage of when they hire somebody to come and do this because all of us are smarter than one of us. Well, now you're in a situation where something breaks. You may not even be sure what specialty area you need to call to even get it fixed. And then the idea of what needs to be done versus what has to be done versus what would be nice to be done. So you see people come in and 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 they sell you 
these extended warranties and they sell you all of these extra services. Whereas if the other spouse was there, they may say, no, we don't need any of that stuff. So you end up spending more money than you would if you were a couple because you don't have the benefit of the knowledge of the other person anymore. You know, the other person who may have known something about that area or may have had some expertise at it, that's gone. So now you're at the mercy of the salesperson there and how good they can convince you to to take on all these extra things that you may not have really needed anyway. Jim, you mentioned, you know, fathers are not necessarily just fathers, but spouses who are obligated to pay child support and then withhold it. Mm -hmm. And um, in most states that I've been in, lived in or worked in, they have deadbeat dads. In California, when I was young, they were putting up billboards on the highways with names of some, you know, deadbeat dads to embarrass them into paying child support. I don't think they're allowed to do that anymore. Um, some places ran newspaper or, or columns every week saying these are the dads that haven't paid their child support this week. I've never, in all the years that I've um, been working with families, seen deadbeat moms as a term. And I researched this about 15 years ago. Um, a lot of men... Yeah, they're being selfish, but some men are psychologically wounded by the disenfranchisement that they get because they might have the money, but they don't have the kids. Right. So sometimes that emotional assault, you're mm-hmm. talking about the emotional cost, mm-hmm. gets leveraged against the other person. So dads won't pay their child support because now they can't see their kids, either mm-hmm. because they're not allowed or because there's a barrier. And that prevents them from having to experience the onslaught of emotional anguish when they go to visit the kids or when they write the check. So sometimes it's a two-way street on that one. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if someone doesn't pay their child support, you know, you don't have any way of financial stability. And then your kids don't have it. And the person who's withholding mm-hmm. it says, yeah, but, and they want mm-hmm. a reason, unless they're just being selfish. And there are a lot of those people out there. Uh, I see it with men and women, but you're right. It's mostly men have the child support. It's simply a matter of stepping up and taking care of your obligation, whether the child is living with you or not, as the that parent you have an obligation for that support, and either you provide it or you don't. And I'm surprised at the number of cases that we encounter where it's withheld, and it appears to be nothing more than pure selfishness on the part of the person who should be providing. But it goes back to something that Kathy said early on. You couldn't control this person you were married to them. Why do you think you can control them now? I like that. And how many people do you see who... Even before they're divorced, they're in another relationship. They, as soon as the divorce happens, they get married. Mm -hmm. They've moved on, they think. They've not dealt with their issues. They've not dealt with their pain. They've not dealt with, you know, the trauma that's been caused to them and that they've caused to others because they just want to get this behind them and move on. Well, Ongoing financial obligations is part of what keeps them from moving on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if you've disposed of your spouse and you've disposed of your children so that you can move on, I guess that in the person who's done that, they feel free, but they've left a whole lot of damage in the background. If somebody was unfaithful in a marriage and you're getting divorced because they were unfaithful, in the most sacred elements of physical intimacy, there's no reason to believe that they're going to be honest and faithful when it comes to financial issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things is, is, is knowing the person truly coming to know the person that you're divorcing or who's divorcing you. Um, and, and, and part of it is, is the fact that, that it is such an emotionally, you don't even realize how tied up, Everything you have at that time is in your emotions. You don't realize how much your emotions are affecting. You think you're thinking clearly, but you're not. You can't even be aware of that. Yeah, you're rationally irrational. Yeah. And so so it's kind of, I mean, we are in, gratefully, in the position now that we can step back at, you know, from the situation and we can see things that we didn't see before um, about about our our how we handled things and how they handled things and um that's a huge part of healing by the way but um your emotions it's amazing it is so amazing what emotions can do but once again is yes, that's the whole thing is getting as much 
becoming so much aware, more aware of yourself and becoming more aware of, of how, how you work. And that's where having a good therapist is awesome. I had one for 17 years. She was wonderful. But having a good therapist, but also having the support that you can talk to other people, um, that maybe you'll hear something from them that'll click that you won't, it won't click if you hear it from somebody else. Well, when you are financially codependent mm -hmm. for your post-divorce, you're going to be emotionally codependent yep. too, because you cannot separate those two. So let's say you win you know, quote, air quotes here, when the settlement that you want, now you're dependent on that other person to do their part because contracts are easily broken. People don't always comply. And now the emotions are back in play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, from a practical standpoint, and this may not be possible, but you're better off to get everything you're wanting to get up front than to be obligated on the come. Yes. Um, it's just, you know, take an extra ten or twenty thousand dollars and let this person off of the hook for child support and spousal support, because at least, you know, you'll get that at the point of the settlement. Mm -hmm. But if you're expecting that ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars over the next ten years, odds of you getting it are actually pretty low. So you're better to take more of a guarantee up front, although it may be a smaller amount than to try to get more over time because I, I can't tell you how many people that we see in divorce care who people just don't, once the decree is signed, people don't fulfill their obligations. I see a lot of people, particularly men, but a lot of people um, will give up all their assets to cover the child support ahead of time so that they don't have to be obligated to their ex. So they can make that break. Even if they're still on visitation, they don't have the financial connection and that takes a lot of the argument away from them mm -hmm. they give up the house and everything else so you can have it all i'll take my tools and i'll go i see that a lot i see a lot of wives will give up everything in order not to have a fight over custody but they become financially dependent upon yeah i person. yeah i was i was that was nothing in which i was fortunate um in that um our discussion at the kitchen table where we're saying, well, which couch do you want? Which couch do you? I sat down and wrote everything down. Which couch do you want? Which this, that? Um, I was told, I was told, I do not want to pay alimony. I won't pay alimony. To which I said, well, okay, then if you give me 100% custody of the kids, primary custody of the kids, I won't even ask for it. And that's what happened. It was, and it was for me, it was so worth it. You know, it was so worth it. And, and I don't know, to, I've never had the conversation with the kid's dad to ask him, did you ever regret making that decision? I mean, I was, I was fair with letting him, you know, even though I had a percent, hundred percent custody, I also firmly believe my kids needed their dad in their life, regardless of, of things. So <laughs> things. Um, things, things. I won't go into things. If you can only see Kathy's face when she says things. <laughs> it was just wasn't a uh, podcast. Was just TV. <laughs> but no, um, it, 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 that to me, you know, even though I had no finances, no, nothing no, to my name, it was well worth it because the fact that I knew I, that I could look out for the best interest from, of my kids. So I guess we just hit on the bottom line here. The financial impacts of divorce are part of the emotional content of divorce. They cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. So if you don't look at them through that lens mm -hmm. and make decisions, knowing that this is not just a financial decision. Yes, it is a financial decision, but it's not just a financial decision. There's a lot of pain here. And you're going to be living with this outcome for a long time. If kids are involved, it gets more complicated. But there's no such thing as a clean break. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, there's no such thing as an amicable divorce. If you were all that amicable, you wouldn't need getting divorced to begin with. <laughs> right. I know I had one. <laughs> it's not amicable. It's just neater. That's all. A little bit neater. But kinder. Kinder. Well, yeah, we didn't set out to hurt each other. Yeah. But we still both came out impoverished. Yep. Yep. And I, yep, you do. It happens. So I, I, it's a, once again, it's, it's just that awareness, having that awareness. Um, with that, but it's so final thoughts on 
the impacts of finances. I mean, I'm sorry. Final thoughts on impacts of divorce on finances or the financial considerations. Let's just go around and we'll start with you, Kathy. Well, one of the things is what what do you do? What do you do if you are financially impacted by this divorce? What are the you you need to develop tools to handle where looking at where you're at and being honest with where you're at. And and so that means as far as if you're in debt, you've got to face it. You talk to your creditors. You talk to people that can work with you to help you reduce that debt. You reduce your spending even more. You give up things that maybe that you thought were just part of life, you know, um, credit cards, you know, like I said, a lot of people have credit cards and they use them. They talk about that in divorce care, you use them so much it becomes, it's not really a credit card, it's a debit card, you know, and you're, and you're, you have an, because Dave Ramsey was actually one of the speakers on the, on the, on the um, financial part of it. Um, you, you, all you're doing when you use a credit card for, for a financial emergency is giving a new name to that emergency. It's called debt. But <laughs> anyways, um, so, you know, so it's, you need to make wise decisions about everything. And maybe it's going to entail you, gosh, you got to make things from scratch. Who knows how to do that? Um, but so and, and ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help in these situations. And um, and that can also be like if you are reentering the workforce um, to get help. There's people out there that can help you with that, too. So final thoughts, Jim. What's at the bottom of your behavior as you go through this? And by that, I mean, are you focused on money and material? Are you focused on your behavior and what God has called you to do? And I submit that in a lot of cases, we've put God and material, th excuse me, money and material things where the divine guidance that God offers us is supposed to be. And then we head down a road that gets us in trouble. So it has a lot to do with values, character, face, how you treat other people, yeah. all those things. You're right. It's not always about money. Okay. It's usually not about the money. <clears throat> The money just gets in the way. If your goal is, if your heart's wrong, your goal's not going to matter. Yes, it was at the bottom of your heart is yes, what sir. I'm saying. In a lot of cases, it's money and material things. However, how about you, James? Well, you're getting a divorce because one of the two parties, if not both parties in the divorce, want to be free. The freedom is it free. Okay. So this is going to cost. And it's going to cost a lot. And the quicker that you can accept that, the quicker that you can realize that life as you knew it is over, the quicker that you can start living on a budget so that you know what your life really cost you, mm -hmm. the quicker that you can become rational and less emotional and look at this as a business negotiation and look at options like I'll forgo child support and spousal support if I get more money up front. And you have to sit down with somebody who can help you do this. And I would really encourage you to go to Dave Ramsey's website, um, Financial Freedom, because there are elements to all of this that are spiritual, physical, and emotional. But there's the real practical side of this thing, too. Mm -hmm that you've got to start making better decisions and you've got to start making different decisions. And you've got to very quickly come to the realization that you're going to take a step down in lifestyle, that you're going to take an increase in personal responsibility because now you're having to do everything for yourself. And that's just to get through this. And depending on where you are, you know, if you're in your 20s and 30s, well, you still have many more years to be economically productive. If you're in your 50s and 60s, you're in a totally different place. So how are you going to survive through retirement? How are you going to survive, you know, through your latter years of life? This is a big deal. Divorce is a big deal. It is messy. It is damaging. 
it is horrendous. And this is just one more aspect of it. Mm-hmm. The other thing I think you need to do is I think you really need to pray for wisdom. Mm-hmm. You really need to pray and ask God to give you wisdom. And you're going to have to learn how to trust him because, you know, he says at the end of the day that he'll supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. But you're going to have to very quickly get to a point where you can differentiate between what a need is and what a want is because the wants are probably not going to be sustainable. Yeah. One thing I was going to mention too, as you, you touched on is budget. <laughs> People don't like that word budget. It's a four letter word. <laughs> I went to public school. So. You went to public school. Okay. Um, That's I've, a new math. New math. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 that it is so important. And it's, this does not, just to ap- apply to people who are going through divorce. This applies to our general economy. Budget. You take in money. You give out money. You don't give out more money than you have, regardless of whether you want to or not. You know, not everybody follows that. Well, I it's well, I'm, I guess I, I, well, I, I overdo it. Yeah. Well, Jesus talked about this. He's like, look, if you're not faithful in the little things. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be faithful in the big things. Mm -hmm. Having a budget, if you're still married and people being fit, because you can get apps that you can put on your phone. I have an app on my phone. It's called Good Budget. It's free. Mm -hmm. If I was married, I would hope that my spouse would use it because the budget's the budget. And if they spend a dollar and put it in the budget, it takes it out of, I can see it on my phone. They can see it on theirs. Mm -hmm. If you can't trust somebody to- New one. Write down when they spend five dollars. There's a lot bigger issues here because if you're not faithful in the little things, you won't be faithful in the big things. You're at a point now where the faithfulness has gone out the window. So don't assume they're going to be faithful in anything at this point. Only probably thought I have is that while we're talking about the financial burden or strain, financial cannot be separated from the emotional cost. You mentioned, uh, Kathy, earlier, uh, just a few minutes ago, you mentioned debt. The financial debt is just part of it. There's the emotional debt that goes yeah. with it. Let's say you do win something up front. You're going to be paying for it emotionally. If you mm-hmm. lose something up front, you'll be paying for it emotionally. It doesn't go away just mm-hmm. because you've negotiated this contract. You are tied emotionally to the financial outcomes of the divorce. Even when you divide it 50-50 and it's perfect, I guarantee you one or both of the partners are going to feel like they still got shafted. Mm-hmm. I'm reminded of the way back when Dick Van Dyke did a movie back you know, showing my age. And I think it was in the sixties called divorce American style. This was back when divorce mm-hmm. wasn't so popular and the lawyers going down all the assets that the wife was going to get the house, the car, the clothes, the furniture, the jewelry. He was getting all the debts. He says, I get it now. She gets the diamonds in the diamond mine. All the lawyers go, what diamond mine? You didn't mention the diamond mine. And he says, and I get the shaft. <laughs> <laughs> and I guarantee you, I don't care how well you come out in the divorce. You'll feel like you're the one who got the shaft mm-hmm. because the emotional cost is huge. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, they teach you in business negotiations that if all parties are equally happy, then you've had a good negotiation. But divorce negotiation is exactly the opposite. If all parties are equally unhappy, then you're probably somewhere close to fair. Mm-hmm. You know, that's unfortunately very true. I think if people get their hearts in the right place before they get married, hopefully, mm-hmm. or if they get into a struggle and they actually look to the spiritual, because this is a spiritual union. Mm-hmm. This is joining our souls together. This is why it's painful. This is why God hates divorce. James has said that this to me off the record so many times. God hates divorce, not because... Of the divorce, it's because of the damage it does. He doesn't want to see his children go through this much pain. Yeah. He loves us too much to sit there and watch us go through this much pain. But unfortunately, we've made our choices and some things are beyond his control because mm-hmm. he won't infringe on our will. Mm-hmm. And we've allowed things to creep into the picture that contribute to hardness of heart. Mm-hmm. So we've lost focus on the spiritual element. That should be at the bottom of the of the deepest part of your heart. And I think you make a really good point there, Jim, because as you go through this, the aftermath of this, you have a choice to make. You, you can become hard as a diamond 
or you can be broken and you can have your heart broken and you can start to reheal and remend Mm -hmm. and you can forgive and you can become a different person and you can own what was on your side of the line and deal with those issues and move forward. But if you decide to continue to harden your heart, you're going to be a bitter, lonely person. Yeah. And also, also taking into consideration, like you said, you know, tr- trusting in God. You know, yeah, you're in a very bad place. Um, and this is from my own personal experience of where I was financially. Um, and we are by no means rich at this point in time. But you know what? We have what we need. We honestly have what we need. We've gotten to that point. And that, to me, in, in, in itself, that's enough. God will give us what we need. This, wouldn't you agree, Jim? He grants all our needs according to his riches. Yeah. All we have to do is figure out the difference between a need and a want. Yeah. <laughs> so trusting God, trusting God through this whole process of, of, of healing, that God will see us down this, down this path that we're on of, of divorce, those that have had to make that choice. Um, he will see us. He will see you through it. And, you know, for those who might be listening that don't have that understanding, that mm. faith, that, that, tradition or that experience mm-hmm. it sounds pat it sounds like yeah. a crutch it sounds to a lot of people like this is just those people talking right but for those of us who've gone through it mm-hmm. if it wasn't for faith if it wasn't for knowing god has a good intention for us mm-hmm. i don't think i would have made it through her no but that's where the healing is so i would encourage anyone who who poo poos that listening to this stop for a moment and think about the cost and think about the benefit mm-hmm. and just think mm-hmm. about you know, maybe they they have a point. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's something I should check out. I'm looking at my finances. I'm looking at my emotions. I'm looking at all these other things. Maybe I should look at my heart, and my faith too. Mm-hmm. Just just an aside. Yep. Well, guys, I appreciate you coming out, and we'll be talking again next week. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Counselors on the Couch is brought to you by Virginia Beach Christian Counseling, specialists in family counseling, grief, trauma, and loss. Find us at www.virginiabeachchristiancounseling.com. Counselors on the Couch is produced and directed by John Bell, executive producer Dr. Chuck Carrington, with original music score and mastering by John Tyler Music. The opinions expressed here are of the host and the individual guests and are not necessarily the opinion of Virginia Beach Christian Counseling. If you would like to make a comment or would like to ask to be a guest, please go to counselorsonthecouch.com.